So again, thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is, as I told you, my name is uh, Sara Tevillo Haini. And uh, today we're gonna cover uh, a subject, which I think probably for everyone, it's uh, kind of a, of a brain wrecking when you're trying to do a, a good ultrasound. So I'm gonna try and give you some tips to, to do that. So let's get started. Okay, so um, there are two ways to perform an ultrasound or two ways to position the animal when you're performing an ultrasound. The first way is uh, laying on their side. This is something that uh, we do in Italy and I have seen it uh, do it in uh, other European countries. I have to say that uh, obviously I haven't worked all over the world so I don't know uh, how you do <laughs> only in, in every country but I have to say that for example in the States where I uh, worked they also and they didn't do it uh, on their side. And I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about why do I do it on their side. So what are the pros of uh, doing it on their side? Well, first of all, it's a very natural position. So dogs are more likely uh, to last longer because they're comfortable. Second of all, um, there's only gonna be one person needed to hold them. This obviously is most of the times because obviously we're gonna have very large dogs or we're gonna have uh, very nervous, um, also very nervous dogs and owners uh, that they're not going to be able to hold them. So sometimes we need two, even three people to hold it. But I have to say most of the times just with the owner or just with the, the other veterinarian, you're going to be able to do it. And then the last thing is you don't need any extra positioners. This is something that is very important uh, for us who do freelance and we have to move all over the place because that way we don't have to carry it with us. So what are the cons? I don't see many. Actually, I don't see any. So that's, what, um, that's why I choose to do this. The other way, obviously, is laying on their back. And this is what I've seen in uh, most of the other countries. Um, I have to say, um, the pros are gonna be that the animals stay okay. Cons are gonna be the opposite of uh, doing it on their side. So when you start um, to do an ultrasound, you have to be organized. You have to follow an order. It doesn't matter what kind of order you wanna do. It, uh, what it matters is that you always do the same order and that you follow it. So when you're organized, you're gonna do a faster exam. You're gonna do a more complete exam because it's hard to forget it. I'm gonna explain why now. And then you're gonna do a better report. So if you always follow the same order, you are gonna know what is coming next. So you know that after, for example, let's say after uh, the spleen, you're gonna do the liver or you're gonna do the stomach. That way, if you always follow the same order, you're not gonna forget to do other, um, to do all the organs. So sometimes you're doing the ultrasound and you're thinking, did I already uh, take a look at the testicles? Did I already do the spleen? So if you follow the same order, you're not gonna have that problem. And also when you're doing the report, you can go through your head, you can go all through the, the order that you have, and that way you're not going to miss anything to write down. Okay, so I don't know if you remember from year one of vet school, <laughs> anatomy class, and uh, this is what it looks like, an abdomen in the dog. So they took out the bladder, bladder's right here, and uh, so here we have the intestines, here we have the left kidney, spleen, stomach and liver. Oh, sorry. Let me go. There you are. Um, we, if we take the first layer out, liver. Here we have the tail of the spleen, the head of the spleen, stomach, left kidney, and intestines. So I wanted you to show this, uh, or I wanted you to, to see this, because that way you have an idea of what you're looking when you're doing an ultrasound. Okay, so I'm gonna tell you my order. I don't, again, I think it's something that is very personal. For me, it's very, very, it's very easy to follow it. So I always start with, So you get what I, I always start with. 
I take a look if uh, they have any thrombos. I look at the medial iliac lymph nodes, which are over there. Then I move cranially following the aorta, and I look at the left kidney. Caudal to the left kidney, I'm going to take a look at the ovary, if they're not spayed, obviously. Then I move a little medial, and I'm going to take a look at the adrenal gland. Later, I'll go over how, like, where they position and everything. Then I go cranially, and I look at uh, the spleen. Then we go through a ventral, take a look at the stomach. Then cranially, I take a look at the liver. And then I swipe all the intestines all through the mid-abdomen. Also with the lymph nodes that we're going to find there. And finally, before I uh, turn them over and before I take a look at the other side, always take a look at the testicles, obviously, if they're not neutered. This is something that for me it's important to do and to place it at the same order because it's something that is not in the, in the abdomen. So a lot of times we forget. And I have to say, I forget, obviously. <laughs> We're not perfect. So um, I think it's always good to put it in the order because that way you don't forget to do it. So then we turn them over and we take a look at the right side. The right side, I start with the intestines where I left it uh, in the left side. I take a look at all the intestines and the lymph nodes that we, find, that we have there. Then I move uh, a little bit dorsally to, the, uh, to take a look at the adrenal gland, right kidney, and right ovary and right uterine horn, obviously, if they're not spayed. Then I move cranially. I take a look at the liver, obviously, the right side of the liver. Take a look at the stomach. Uh, it's important that uh, you take a look at all, like the whole organ, even from the uh, left side and the right side. And finally, um, I take a look at the pancreas. So uh, I want you all to acknowledge that today we're doing a 60 to 90 minute um, little or webinar. It's not a course, um, so we can't cover everything. I'm gonna try to be uh, as schematic as possible. I'm gonna try to be direct, uh, but we can't cover everything. So. Today, what I did is we're going to cover the mostly seen and most relevant features, okay? So how organs should be? Let's start with the bladder. So the wall in dogs, um, it varies, the thickness varies with the stension. This is the article that you can find it. Uh, what is important here for you to know is that depending on the distension, you're going to have a thickness, a uh, different thickness. This is important because a lot of times we have empty bladders and uh, you might think, oh, is this very th uh, thick and wall? And it might not be. It might just be that it's uh, completely empty. In cats, it should be less than 1.7 millimeters. And um, it is layered, but sometimes it's very difficult to find. The urine should be anechoic. And here you can see on the left side, we have a cat. On the right side, we have a dog's urinary bladder. And as you can see, it's very thin and the layers that you might see there, you might see there, it's difficult to find when it's uh, completely in full. The uterus, this is something that I, I remember in the States, um, most of uh, dogs and cats are spayed and neutered. So it's something that you might not see very often in the States and other countries, which hopefully someday it'll be in most of the countries. But uh, in Southern uh, European countries, we still have a lot of dogs and cats that are not spayed in years. So it's important to, to not to forget that we have to take a look at the uterus. Uh, so where is it? It's ventral to the bladder and it's dorsal to the colon. So what I usually do is I go a little bit ventral to the bladder. If you see the colon, then you went too far. So right there, you're gonna see the body of the, of the uterus. Then you can follow it. Uh, through the horns, it, obviously it, uh, they're not spayed. Um, what should it look like? Well, it's a hypoechoic tubular structure. Obviously, this is going to depend on the cycle, or the moment of the cycle. Five out of six months, you're going to be in diestrus or in estrus, and it's uh, going to be, um, again, uh, hypoechoic tubular structure, not layered with no luminal content. And then it's going to be one to one and a half months, out of six that are, you might be in proestrus, estrus, and early diestrus, where you're gonna find a layer wall and some luminal content. This is very important that you ask the owner when was the last heat. And I have to say a lot of times they don't know, 
But this is important because if you find some luminal content uh, and it's in, um, in diesters or in esters, it's not normal. If you do find it in proesters, esters, or early diester, then it could be normal. So this is what it looks like. On the left side, we have a normal uterus. On the left side, it's also normal uterus. You can see a little bit of layering here. So probably in this, in this case, it was uh, probably early diesterous. The prostate. So it's caudal to the bladder. And sometimes it happens very often when we have a very large dog that uh, has been peeing all over <laughs> all over the, the, the garden in front of the, of the clinic and then they come inside and the bladder is completely empty, it might be very difficult to visualize it. So don't get nervous, it happens. So a lot of times what I do is then I wait, I do uh, the, the rest of the exam and at the end I try and look at it again to like, um, leave it a little bit of time for the bladder to, to fill a little bit. Uh, what should it look like? Well, in intact dogs, it's going to be homogeneous and the, eco uh, the ecogenicity is going to be a medium ecogenicity, but it's going to change with age. So it's going to increase its uh, ecogenicity and its size. Uh, there's a little formula that you can find. I didn't put it because I, I didn't want you to like to bomb you with uh, different things, but, uh, but uh, you, can, you can try and find that uh, little formula. It goes by weight. Then in neuter dogs, it's going to be small. It's going to be homogeneous and it's going to be hypoechoic, as you can see here. So this was, a, I would say, a medium-sized dog. And uh, as you can see, very homogeneous, hypoechoic, and not too big. Lymph nodes. I'm not going to go over all the lymph nodes that there are in the, in the abdomen, because we could be here until tomorrow. But uh, the main, uh, this is a little scheme, a uh, little diagram of uh, where they are, but the main ones that uh, you're always going to see are going to be these, which are the medial iliac lymph nodes. As you can see, this is the aortic bifurcation. And then these, which are the either um, jejunal lymph nodes or mechasinic lymph nodes, they're the same. So medial iliac lymph nodes, jejunal lymph nodes. Okay, kidneys. So the left kidney is going to be caudal to the splenic head and the right kidney, which we all know that is more cranial, it's going to be in contact with the hepatic caudate lobe. What should they look like? Well, let's start with the size. Uh, in cats, they're going to be between 3 and 4.5 centimeters. In dogs, it completely varies with, um, with the, the size of the dog. So there's, uh, here's a, there's an article uh, where they they did this ratio with, uh, with the aorta. So you measure the kidney, the length of the kidney, you measure the aorta, the, the diameter of the aorta, and uh, that ratio, if it's less than 5.5, then you have a small kidney. If it's over 9.1, then you have a, a large kidney. I think this is very, this is very helpful because a lot of times we are not sure, especially with big dogs, that we're not sure if we're looking at a, a big kidney or with small dogs, if we're looking at a small kidney. Um, I think it's uh, very helpful. The cortex should be hypoechoic, or yeah, it's usually hypoechoic to isoechoic to the liver, and it's hypoechoic to the spleen. The medulla is going to be hypoechoic to the cortex, and the renal pelvis should be less than two to three millimeters. The ureter, you should not see it. So when it's normal, is not usually seen. This is very important for you to remember. So I probably you all know, but uh, uh, echogenicity, we're going to start with the spleen. The spleen is a more hyperechoic, then it's going to be the liver. And then the liver is going to be hyperechoic to the kidney or isoechoic. But why is this very important? Because when we, uh, when we have a doubt if uh, we have a hyperechoic kidney, then we can compare it to the spleen and um, we can see if it's a hyperechoic to the spleen, then we definitely have a hyperechoic uh, kidney. Same thing with the liver. And here you have normal kidneys. Here's a large Greek dog, a medium-sized dog, and a cat. So you can see Medulla is a hypoechoic to the cortex, and the cortex, you can see, well, I didn't compare it here, but you can see that it's pretty hypoechoic to what a normal spleen or a liver. Ovaries, this is something that a lot of people <laughs> probably have never seen, but um, they're going to be caudal to the kidney. They're 
once you see uh, one, then you're always gonna know know what, what they look like. So um, what they should look like, it depends also on the time of the um, of, uh, cycle. So when we have an estrus, an early proestrus, they're gonna be small. So there can be one to two centimeters, they're gonna be homogeneous and hypoechoic. When we start proestros, they're gonna start uh, getting large and they might have some anechoic areas. When we go into estrus, then all those anechoic areas are gonna be much, uh, we're gonna multiply and also it's gonna be very, very enlarged um, ovary. And then when we start diestrus, it's gonna start reducing its size in the anechoic areas too. Again, this is something uh, that is important when you're doing an, an exam because if you, uh, if you can see the ovaries, you're going to probably have an idea of what time of the, of the cycle we are. And that way you're going to see if the uh, uterus, it's normal for that time of the, of the cycle or not. Here we have uh, the left ovary here. There's the left kidney. Right ovary and right here is the right kidney. Okay, the adrenal glands. So in dogs, um, what I, this is a little tip that I do. So what I start, I start from the bifurcation of the aorta. I'm gonna start following the aorta cranially and right before the kidney, there's gonna be a little artery coming out, which is the renal artery. Cranial to that artery, we're gonna find the left adrenal gland. So uh, try and exercise with that. Because again, once you see the renal artery, you just have to swipe over to one side or the other, like medial and lateral, medial letter, and it's gonna pop up. Same thing with, uh, with the right um, adrenal gland. It's gonna be caudal to the right kidney. But also what you're gonna do is you're gonna find the aorta, you're gonna find the caudal vena cava, and you're gonna start swiping in between, and then it's gonna, uh, you're gonna see it right there. In cats, you just have to know that they're medial to the kidney, and um, Sometimes I, I, I've seen that uh, most of the times they're more cranial than in dogs. What should they look like? They're hypoechoic, especially in cats. They're very hypoechoic. They might have some uh, little hyperechoic, in cats, hyperechoic um, areas, which are physiologic, they're little um, calcifications. And uh, maximum measures uh, six to eight millimeters in dogs and 4.5 millimeters in cats. And here we are. So left adrenal gland in the dog has the little nut. Then we have the right adrenal gland. As you can see, so he, this is the uh, left kidney. This is the liver, this is the aorta. In the cats, this is the kidney. So it's a little more cranial than in dogs. This is the left adrenal gland. And then this is the right adrenal gland. You can see here a little bit of uh, that hypercoic area. This is the liver. Okay, so the spleen, the, um, the spleen head, you're gonna find it in a, the base of a triangle done by uh, the left kidney, the stomach, and the liver. So right in that base of the triangle, you're gonna find the head of the, of the spleen, and you're gonna have to swipe the whole organ to make sure that we don't miss anything, because we have to make sure that uh, if we follow everything, we don't miss any abnormalities because sometimes they're going to be very, very small and they might be in the tail or they might be in the body. So please follow the whole organ. Um, normal aspect, it's the most homogeneous uh, organ that you're going to see and it's going to have a hyperechoic capsule and it has a very fine ecotexture. Here you have one of the cat, hyperechoic capsule, and here is the spleen hyperechoic capsule and the spleen. I have to say with the Mindray M9, uh, the um, quality of the image is so good that you might think from these images that they're a little bit heterogeneous, but they're not. I think it's something that, uh, again, uh, the quality of the image is so good that sometimes you see everything. Um, once you see it live, you're not gonna have that uh, impression. But, um, this is kind of like when, uh, when we all started with, um, with digital x-rays that we thought that all the dogs had a uh, bronchial pattern. Well, this is the same thing. But uh, again, this, these two are normal spleens. Okay, the stomach. The stomach is gonna be caudal to the liver and um, it's gonna be layered. You're gonna have a hyperechoic serosa and a hyperechoic 
submucosa, and a hypoechoic muscular and a hypoechoic mucosa. It has rugal falls. That makes it uh, hard sometimes to, when the stomach is empty, sometimes uh, it makes it hard to measure the wall. But when you can measure, it's going to be less than five millimeters in, in dogs and less than four millimeters in cats. Same thing as uh, with the other organs. It's very important that you scan the whole organ. That uh, You start from the fundus, which is closer to the liver. You move all the way through the body, which is, is going to be dorsal and caudal. And then on the, on the right side, you're going to look at the pyloric area. So here we have the fundus, this is the liver. Here we have the body and the pyloric area. And you can see this is the liver. Intestines. So um, with intestines, I'm going to go through all the different segments. I think it's hard at the beginning to to know exactly or to differentiate between the segments. Some of them are going to be easier, some of them are not. I'm just going to give you a, a few tips, but uh, I think exercising a lot is going to help you. So duodenum, is, you're going to find it on the right side. It has a rectilinear course and is the thickest segment in dogs. So it's going to be less than 4.4 millimeters and, um, in dogs and less than 2.2 in cats. The main thing in the duodenum is that Two-thirds of the wall are mucosa. So most of the wall, you're going to see the big mucosa, big hypoechoic um, layer. The jejunum is similar. It's very similar, but it doesn't follow a rectilinear course. So it's, it's going to do some loops. It's a little more in the mid-abdomen, but especially you can see that it does some loops. It's a little thinner, so it's going to be up to 3.8 millimeters. And uh, in cats, the um, mucosa is only, be, is only gonna be half of the wall. And then the ileum. The ileum for me, it's a little uh, easier to, to differentiate from the other two, especially because you can try and look for the ileocecocolic junction and then follow the whole ileum. But um, uh, the main thing is that uh, the, the layering, they have similar contributions, so they're not gonna be all mucosa. Uh, in cats, though, this is the thickest segment. So it's going to be the submucosa and muscular are going to be more prominent, and in cats, you're going to be, uh, you're going to see again that this is the thickest segment. And then you're going to see the colon and the cecum. The cecum usually is filled with gas, so unless it's very abnormal, you're not going to, you're not going to be able to, to see very well. I mean, to um, examine very well. Um, and then again, you look for the ileocecocolic junction and then you're gonna start uh, the ascending colon. And on the left side, you're gonna see the descending colon. It's gonna, they're, um, gonna be filled with uh, feces. And uh, the, the wall has layers that are also are similar in contribution, but uh, the wall is very thin. It's up to 1.5 millimeters. So uh, here we can have, you can see the duodenum, rectilinear course, the left kidney, you can see that the mucosa is covering most of the, of the thickness of the wall. Here, I want you to see this because uh, I want you to acknowledge the importance of fasting. When we have a bowel, a lot of uh, veterinarians say, oh, yeah, he ate this morning, but it doesn't matter because uh, it's not uh, anymore in the, in the stomach. Well, it does matter because when we have um, uh, a bowel filled with, uh, with a pattern that is um, ingested, so it's a food pattern, we're not going to be able to, to see the wall completely. So I think it's very important for you to know that this is what it's going to look like. So as you can see, yeah, maybe this is uh, probably this is the jejunum, but again, with the, uh, with the food inside, we're not going to be able to, to do a good exam. And then these two are the jejunum. You can see that they're very similar to the duodenum, but they do loops. So you're gonna see little cuts like this. Then here we have the ileocecocolic junction, and here you have the ileum. This is where the, this, uh, where the colon starts. This is the colon. So you can, see the, you can see the feces, you can see the wall, and I want you to see here, it's one millimeter in this case. So it's a very thin wall. Okay, the liver. So um, this is a little diagram of uh, 
where you're going to see subcoastal. So the left side, we're going to see the left lobes and the quadrate lobe with the gallbladder. On the right side, we're going to see the right lobes, the quadrate lobe with the gallbladder, and we're going to see the caudate lobe, which is the more caudal lobe there. You can see this is where the kidney stays. Okay, so as you say, um, as you know, it's subcostal and cranial to the stomach. Its size were, is very sub, uh, subjective to know to see the size, but the most um, helpful thing that you can see is that the tips should be pointed. So if you have the rounded tips, you're going to know that it's an enlarged liver. It's hypoechoic and heterogeneous parenchyma, especially compared to the, to the spleen, and it has a coarser echotexture compared to the spleen too. This is uh, something that um, is very helpful also to remember is that uh, the vessels in the, um, in the liver, they have a hyperechoic wall. And this is uh, good to remember, especially when we have a big mass that we don't know the origin, we don't know if it's part of the spleen or part of the, of the liver, because uh, when it's lost all this structure, you can't find it or it's very, very big. You have to try and see what is the attachment. If you see hyperechoic wall, the vessels, then you know that you're in the liver. Then the gallbladder uh, has an anechoic content, or should have an anechoic content. Sometimes, I have to say a lot of times, you're going to see sludge, which is hyperechoic uh, sediment. But uh, a lot of times, uh, you can see it in asymptomatic dogs and cats, especially when they're fasted. The wall should be less than one millimeter thick, and um, it's going to be empty or uh, less full when they, after they've eaten. The common bile duct is going to be dorsal to the portal vein and it's going to be ventral to the duodenum. So you can swipe a little bit between the portal vein and the duodenum, you're going to see right there. It's less than four millimeters in cats and less than three millimeters in dogs. So here in the upper left, we have a normal liver with a gallbladder and the hyperechoic vessel wall. Normal liver, gallbladder, hyperechoic vessel wall. And then I want to show you this. You're probably going to think it's like, well, that is not a very good image. I want you uh, to see this because this is on the right side. And especially with large breed dogs, you're, um, you're going to have to not, you're not going to be able to go subcostal. You're going to have to go intercostal. So you're going to have to put the transducer in between the ribs. So uh, the image is going to be, obviously, the acoustic window is going to be uh, smaller. So this is a rib. This is another rib that you can see the shadowing. And this is what you're going to look at. So in order to look at the whole um, liver, you're going to have to jump between one uh, intercoastal space and another. OK, testicles. <laughs> Again, a lot of people probably have, uh, haven't seen it. So you shouldn't, uh, you should be in the scrotum and um, you should never clip or put alcohol just with the gel. Um, it's very good because they get very irritated. They are of a medium echogenicity and they're pretty homogeneous. They should be symmetrical and um, they have a central hyperechoic line. This is very helpful when you're trying to look for um, a crotorchid testicle. So if you're trying to look in the abdomen or in the inguinal area, this is what is going to tell you that uh, you're looking at a testicle and, for example, not a, not a lymph node. The epididymis runs dorsally and it's hypoechoic with a coarse echotexture, but uh, you're not going to usually examine it unless it's uh, abnormal. So this is what a testicle looks like. This is a small testicle, but <laughs> uh, it was uh, from a small dog. But you can see here the hyperechoic line. And then uh, they're hypoechoic and pretty homogeneous. OK. So the left lobe of the pancreas uh, is not usually seen. It's going to be in a little triangle between the left kidney, the stomach, and the spleen. They're going to find it right there in the middle of that triangle. Uh, don't sweat it out if you, if you can't find it, because uh, it's not usually seen unless it's abnormal. The body, you're going to find it um, in the right cranial abdomen, close to the pyloric region. Um, you're going to find it between the liver and the pyloric region. And the right lobe is going to be dorsal medial to the descending duodenum and ventral to the right kidney. So what I usually do is I start from the duodenum, start going dorsal, 
if I if I get the right kidney, then I went too far. So right in the middle of, um, between those two, you're going to see the right lobe. So normal aspect is going to be homogeneous. It's going to be isoechoid to mildly hyperechoid to the liver, but it's very poorly distinguished from the mesenteric fat. So you're going to have to, to make an eye on uh, doing it uh, like all the times trying to find it because it's uh, at the beginning it's hard to see. Um, pancreatic duct is not usually seen in dogs because it's very small as you can see it's 0.6 millimeters and in cats it's going to be less than one millimeter and then the mean right lobe uh, it's less than eight millimeters in dogs less than 4.4 millimeters in cats. So here you have the right lobe of the pancreas this was in a cat and here you have the right lobe of the pancreas, this was in a dog. Okay, now we're gonna go through the abnormal findings. Again, we're gonna see the mostly C and most prevalent disorders. We can't go through everything, so we're gonna see the, the ones that are gonna see the most. Oh, sorry, let me. Okay, bladder stones. So, oh, sorry, we're gonna, with the bladder, we're gonna go through uh, different um, abnormal, abnormalities in content and abnormalities of the wall. So uh, we can find some bladder stones. Bladder stones are gonna be hyperechoic with a distal shadow. Most of the time, sometimes you're not gonna see it. And it's, uh, you're gonna find a twinkling sign with the color Doppler. For urethral stones, they're more or less the same, but obviously in the urethra, and if you see dilation of the urethra, then there's some obstruction. Then finally, some gas. So you might see uh, gas in emphysematous um, cystitis, diabetes, but this is also important for you to remember. If the dog or the cat has been catheterized, you might just uh, have gas because of the catheter, and it's gonna be luminal. So it's gonna be um, inside the, uh, the bladder. Then alterations of the wall. So you might have cystitis, uh, which is a, a thickened wall. It's going to be hypoechoic, hyperechoic. It can happen either way. And uh, you, you're going to see the layer wall. It's usually craniodentral. And um, you might see polypoid cystitis. Uh, polypoid cystitis, you're going to see pedunculated areas, and they're usually craniodentral. And then finally, you might see a neoplasia. It's an irregular, usually an irregular mass, mixed echogenicity. It can happen in any region, but, um, but uh, most of the times you're gonna find it in the trigon or the, also or the craniventral area. Important for you to remember that it depends on the distension of the wall. So as we said before, the thickness depends on the distension. So Make sure that um, you have uh, a full bladder in order to really visualize and, or, and be able to, to, to see that there is a thickened wall and not only uh, an empty bladder. I hope you can all hear me because I see that I'm, they're popping up in the chat, so I hope that you can hear me. Sarah, I can hear, uh, you can hear me. Your question. Okay. Yeah, no, no, because I, I can see the chat coming up. And no, no, no. Uh, so they are sure uh, placing some question, but uh, about uh, your okay. voice is at the moment is uh, perfect. Okay, good. Okay, so here we have some um, bladder stones. So you can see here, hyperechoic with the shadow, and then we have the twinkling sign with the color Doppler. Here we have a. Uh, uh, polypocytes side where we have a, a little polyp in the craniventral area and this was a urethral stone. In this case it wasn't um, dilated the urethra so it wasn't making any obstruction at the moment. Okay, uterus. So what are the abnormal findings? Um, pregnancy obviously and um, uh, something that you have to remember is the uterine involution is going to take uh, three to four weeks in the dog and 24 days in the cat. This is important because a lot of times they bring you the dog or the cat uh, with some 
discharge, uh, vaginal discharge. So when you see it, if it's only been two weeks and you still see some uh, content in the uterus, it's, it can still be normal. So just um, just make sure that um, that uh, you remember that uh, the involution can take up to four weeks. You're going to see cystic endometrial hyperplasia. Uh, as you all know, it's a hyperechoic uh, uterus with high, uh, anechoic areas. And you might see some abnormal content, as you all know, pyometra, hemometra, hydrometra, mucometra. It is not possible to accurately distinguish with ultrasound. You might have some hints with, um, depending on the type of, um, of liquid that there is. So if it's very anechoic, uh, it could be hydrometra, but it could also be a pyo. If it's um, carpusculated, it could be anything. But, um, but again, just, um, just make sure that you can't accurately distinguish between all of them. And then you might find uh, neoplasia as with every organ. Remember, the cystic endometrial hyperplasia can become a pyometria, hemometria, hydrometria, or mucometria. This is something uh, for the owners to know because a lot of times we do it, we say it, and they're completely um, calm about, oh, okay, it's not, a, it's not a pyo. Well, in two weeks, it can become a pyo. So just remember um, to tell the owners that. So here we have a little fetus. Here we have what I think in this case it was a pio, um, so a lot of content with dilated uterus. And here and here is the bladder. We have a spayed uh, animal that was spayed after um, when, when it was already old. And um, in this case, they didn't do any further exam to know what it was. In my opinion, uh, at that moment, it was probably a neoplasia. It was very irregular. It was pretty vascularized uh, and is very irregular and very hypoergoic. So, uh, and this homogeneous, as you can see. So in my opinion, it could be a neoplasia, but they didn't want to, to do any farther testing. So we're not gonna know. Okay, the prostate. So with um, the prostate, we can have benign prosthetic um, hyperplasia. You're gonna find a hyperechoic uh, prostate with or without anechoic areas, which are uh, intraparenchymal cysts. You might see prostatic and preprostatic uh, cysts. You can see prostatitis, which is often not possible to differentiate between prostatitis and benign prostatic uh, hyperplasia. You might see abscesses, which are usually complication of prostatitis. And you can see also neoplasia, which is usually in uh, newer dogs. So here we have an abscess, as you can see right there. This was a little cyst. This was a, a big abscess. This, I put you this because um, this was in a Cushing, um, in a dog that had Cushing's disease. So we have all the calcifications of the prostate. And then this is a benign prostatic, uh, prostatic hyperplasia. Lymph nodes. Lymph nodes can be either reactive or neoplastic. This is something that you have to remember. You can't differentiate just with um, basic ultrasound between the two of them. You would have to do contrast and haste ultrasound and a uh, fine needle aspirate. You can't say, oh, yes, this is a neoplasia. You can definitely put it on top of the, like the top of the list and say, with the whole picture of the, um, of the clinical, um, case, this is probably a neoplasia, but you can't say for sure, so um, don't, don't forget to put the other uh, diagnostic um, just in case. So if you want to know what it is, you should do contrast and haste ultrasound and a fine needle and aspirate. And then here we have a reactive or neoplastic colic uh, lymph node, it's hypoechoic and enlarged. Here we have a medial ileic lymph node. You can see it's nine centimeters. And this is a difficult case <laughs> that, uh, that I've been seeing. And uh, this was um, is a uh, giant snouter. And uh, I, I really thought that uh, and when I saw it, that it was gonna be neoplastic. Apparently it's, uh, it's a fungal disease. So as you can see, again, you can't see it. It's pretty homogeneous and it's very, very big, but you can't say. And then this is the splenic lymph node. You don't usually see them. 
So um, in this case, it was also uh, reactive or neoplastic. Okay, the kidneys. So uh, we might have hyperechoic kidneys. If it's the cortex, we're gonna have acute renal disease. If it's the cortex and the medulla, uh, it's probably chronic disease. Uh, and uh, that is gonna have a uh, reduced cortical medullary junction. It can also be with a uh, um, kidney with no disease or with an early disease. So you just have to put it and put the, the right down that the kidneys are hyperechoic. Um, but you have to put it all together with blood work and clinical, uh, and clinical signs. The size, if they're enlarged, it's an acute renal disease. If they're small or normal, it can be a chronic uh, kidney disease. They can also be irregular. Then we're going to have nephrolis, so uh, stones. There are hyperechoic areas with acoustic, uh, acoustic shadowing. There, we can also find mineral areas for, uh, with chronic kidney disease, and it's hard to differentiate between um, stones and those mineral areas. And then we might have some neoplasia. They can be focal, multifocal, and then uh, uh, a sign that is very typical in lymphoma in cats. It's a hypoechoic subcapsular sub thickening. So we're gonna be, we're gonna see under the capsule, you're gonna see a hypoechoic line. So here we have chronic kidney disease. As you can see, everything is hyperechoic. Here we have a reduced chronic, uh, sorry, cortical medullary junction. So this is a normal kidney. You can see that the, uh, the junction here is much better. And here, yeah, you can see it that uh, the, you can differentiate the medulla and the, and the um, cortex, but it's reduced from, uh, from this one. Okay, kidneys can also have cysts. Uh, cysts can be from uh, chronic kidney disease or they can be uh, specific of uh, breeds like the current terrier or the Persian. You can see abscesses, and you can also have palictasia. So palictasia, they lay pelvis, and uh, palictasia can be uh, secondary to different things. First of all, obviously, hydronephrosis. So when we have an obstruction, you might see also the dilated ureter. You might see or might not see the cause of the obstruction, um, but it can definitely be one of the causes. The other cause could be pyelonephritis. And then another thing, and this is something uh, for you to remember is that a, a dog or a cat that has been, uh, that has been on fluid therapy or is taking a, a diuretic therapy or even a chronic kidney disease can have palpitation. So don't think that if you see a dilated um, renal pelvis that oh, we have to look for the obstruction or he, uh, he or she has polynephritis. Sometimes we have to talk to the owner and talk to the vet to see uh, blood work and to see what they've been doing uh, in the past few days. So, dilated ureter, dilated ureter and dilated pelvis, this was the same dog, and anechoic cyst. Okay, the spleen. So, um, the size of the spleen is going to be pretty subjective. So, sometimes you just have to do a lot of uh, ultrasounds to know what a spleen uh, should look like. But, uh, a tip to, um, to look for is the, the margins are going to be rounded. So in the spleen, margins should be, t uh, should be um, pointy, let's say like that. And uh, if you see rounded margins, then you know that uh, the spleen is enlarged. In cats, they've been doing, uh, you can see in the panic, <laughs> um, uh, they say that in their opinion, uh, uh, a spleen that measures in thickness more than one centimeter it's, uh, it's an enlarged spleen. And then uh, they can also be normal in size with hyperechoic speckles. This happens in Cushing's disease, this happens in diabetes, and also happens in uh, chronic steroid use. And this, are, this is a rounded edge, as you can see here. Instead of being pointy as it should, it's very rounded. This is a dog that uh, I'll show you later the, the rest of the, of the parenchyma. So I'm not gonna go through all the causes because this is just a list of names. So I think there's something you just have to, to remember and learn. But um, I'm gonna go through how, uh, how a spleen that is enlarged can look like. 
So spindlers and lungs can be normal echoic, and these are the causes. It can be heterogeneous, and these are the causes. It can be hypoechoic, which is less, I have to say, less often you see this. So you only have two options, either it's um, torted, so it's, there's a torsion, or it's uh, a neoplasia most of the times than pump. This is what it looks like when we have an enlarged um, uh, spleen that is heterogeneous. So especially this one, you can see all the different areas, and here you can also see all the different areas. But they shouldn't be there. Okay, then we might have focal and multifocal lesions. They can be hyperechoic, hypoechoic, mixed echogenicity. They can be also large masses, and those masses can be anechoic or heterogeneous. But you would have to do further testing to differentiate between all of them. You can't say for sure if you see an area, a hypoechoic area, they say, oh, it's probably a benign hyperplasia. You can't say it for sure. So please do farther testing, obviously, if the owner wants, but don't put yourselves in a position uh, that you tell the owner it's probably something benign, so let's just uh, hold off and see, and then in three months, we recheck, maybe in three months, it's going to double its size, and uh, maybe it was malignant. So in my opinion, always offer to do farther testing. And in this case, um, we always recommend to do contrast ultrasound and to follow uh, or following a fine needle aspirate. So here we have a, like a little nodule, one centimeter, heterogeneous, and then a very heterogeneous um, and large mass. You can see here, I could follow that this is the spleen. Okay, liver. We are going to have abnormalities uh, in size and contour, in echogenicity, and uh, depending on distribution of the, the abnormalities. So we're going to we're going to see the three different um, the, the different uh, scenarios. So very important. If you want to do a good diagnosis, you have to put together the ultrasound findings, clinical presentation, blood work, and contrast ultrasound with FNA and or biopsy. Why is this important? Because you can't do a complete diagnosis. Obviously, most of the times you're gonna have a clinical presentation and uh, your findings. I would say 50 or 60% of the times you have blood work, not always. <laughs> so please always ask uh, your veterinarians to, to do blood work before we do the ultrasound. And when, once you have this, you can't do a complete diagnosis just with, uh, with these. You might or you're going to have to do this. This is, again, to have a complete diagnosis, okay? Okay, so uh, abnormalities in size. We can have a diffuse uh, and large uh, liver. This is a list of causes. We can have only one lobe or a focal um, enlarged area. These are the causes. And we can also have a small liver. These are the causes. Obviously, with a small liver, uh, the age of the animal and the um, clinical science is going to give you some hints, obviously. So this was a dog. It had uh, cirrhosis. But um, as you can see here, it's a small um, liver, very pointed tips right there. It also had uh, ascites. This is a case that um, when I saw it, uh, I put differential diagnosis, I put fibrosis, cirrhosis, and uh, shunt. It went to five different places. All of them did ultrasound. No one did a, a CT because the owner was a little hesitating to do it. Um, so most of them, they said cirrhosis. I think even if, it, if at the end it was cirrhosis, I think it's always very important that you put all of the differential diagnosis because without, in this case, was a CT. So they did a CT, they saw that uh, there were no shunts, they took a biopsy, and then they saw that it was uh, a cirrhosis. So you can't say it just by ultrasound. Okay, abnormalities in echogenicity. So we might have hyperechoic liver, hypoechoic liver, or mixed echogenicity. Even if you have a mixed echogenicity, it can be hyperplasia, which is benign. It can also be hepatitis, but it can also be neoplasia. This was a diabetic uh, cat. 
it was a I know you can't see it here, but it was a, a, a little large liver, but especially it was very hyperechoic. And this was um, mixed echogenicity liver. They didn't do any further testing. Um, so we're not going to know what it was because a lot of times it just happens. They don't want to do anything else. So, And then you can find uh, focal or multifocal lesions. You're gonna, they can be hyperechoic as with the spleen, hypoechoic, anechoic, or mexicogenicity, the same thing as with the spleen. You have to do farther testing to know what it is. Okay, so here you can see hypoechoic area, mixed echogenicity, and an anechoic area. I put the color Doppler to make sure that it wasn't vascularized or there wasn't a vessel like a dilated vessel or anything like that. Okay, the gallbladder. So uh, with the gallbladder, you can have an obstruction. Um, you're, uh, with an obstruction, you are gonna have a tortoise, uh, common bile duct is gonna be dilated. So it's gonna be over four to five millimeters in cats and um, over three in dogs. And uh, you're not gonna be able to distinguish from uh, chronic inflammation, because as you can see here, one of the causes of obstruction can be inflammation. You're also going to have the too many tubes pattern, so a dilation of uh, the hepatic, uh, hepatic ducts. You can also have, again, from causes inflammation, especially with pancreatitis in cats, the triaditis. You can have edema, uh, you, you might see plugs, and you can also have stones. Abnormalities in the wall, it's a wall that's measure, uh, it's measuring more than uh, one millimeter. And causes can be inflammation, edema, hyperplasia, or Neoplasia. Then we can have a mucosal. Uh, the mucosal, we're going to start uh, when it's at the beginning, you're going to see a hypoechoic mucus that displaces the, the sludge to the center. Then it can become a stellate pattern. And then it can become also a kiwi fruit like pattern. And then finally, we can also have stones. They're hyperechoic and they have acoustic shadowing. Here you can see mucosal, so the hypoechoic mucus that is displacing all the sludge to the center, sorry, to the center, and then the common bile duct that is a little tortuous and is dilated. Okay, the GI tract. So we're gonna go over a few things that can happen. The first thing as uh, with other organs, it's gonna be abnormalities in the content. So foreign bodies. So we're going to have linear foreign bodies. You're going to see a hyperechoic line. I put there with or without shadowing. Most of the times I don't see shadowing. And here is very, uh, very important thing to remember. You're going to see placated battle. So what is placation? Placation is something that uh, when, uh, when we all start doing ultrasounds, we get very nervous to, uh, when we see um, when we see an area that it might be placated, thinking that it's, uh, it's going to be a, a linear foreign body. So let's put on the difference between placation and curvigation. Placation is when the whole wall is involved. So you're going to see harmonic uh, sign, but the whole wall from the serosa to the mucosa is involved. I'll show you a picture now. With curvigation, you're only going to see part of the wall involved. So the serosa is usually normal and straight, and the mucosa and submucosa are usually the ones involved, okay? Then we can have other foreign bodies, which are there, they're gonna be in different shapes in echogenicity, and we might have a perforation. So when we have a perforation, if you're lucky, you're gonna see a focal loss of layering, but um, don't worry if you can't see it, because what you're gonna look at is you're gonna try and find the hyperechoic fats surrounding that area. Okay, so that is going to give you a hint that it might be perforated. So what is important to know about foreign bodies? Well, we have to make sure that it's not obstructed because this is going to tell us what we're going to do, the next step, what we're going to do next. So um, when we see an obstruction, we are going to have a dilated bowel filled with fluid, maybe gas, uh, and it's going to be cranial to a foreign body. Okay, this is important. So why is this important? Because it's going to tell us, do we have to go to surgery? Or can we just do some uh, high fiber diet and maybe recheck it tomorrow? This is very, very important for you. 
And then it's very important also to know and try and figure out what segment of the intestinal tract uh, the foreign body is for a few reasons. First of all, because if we want to recheck it, we want to know if the foreign body is moving. So we say, okay, today's in the duodenum, and then in two days we see it in the ileum, then we know that it's been moving. So that's a, that's a good sign. If we know this in the ileum right before the um, ileocecalic uh, junction, yeah. We, we lost uh, for uh, five <laughs> your voice. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So again, with the obstruction, it's important for you to know if it's obstructed or not because um, it's going to tell you what is the next step going to be. So are you going to send it to surgery? Are you going to do a high fiber diet and recheck it? It also is going to depend on the on the clinical signs, obviously. But for you, it's very important to make sure that uh, uh, there's some obstruction or not. With the obstruction, you're going to be you're going to see a dilated bowel filled with fluid and maybe gas. And it's going to be cranial to the foreign body. And then again, uh, the segment of the intestinal tract is very useful for you to know. First of all, if you're going to recheck it, you're not going to go to surgery. You're going to recheck it, then. Uh, it's good to know if it's in moving or if it's in the same place. Because if I do it today, it's in the duodenum. Do it in three days, it's in the ileum. We know it's been moving. If it's still in the duodenum, we know that after everything we've been doing, it hasn't moved, probably not going to move. Also, it's uh, important for the, for the surgeon. I'm sorry, for the surgeon. <laughs> uh, that way, obviously, they always check everything. But it's also good to, to know where it is. It's, it's hard, I'm not gonna lie, it's hard a lot of times to know exactly where it is. Try and follow the bowel where it is, because when the foreign body, exactly the bowel where it is, you can't see it, but if you try and following it, you might see a normal bowel and try and figure out where it is. So here we have dilated bowel filled with fluid. This was an obstructed um, bowel. Here we have a foreign body. This is some liquid, this is the wall of the intestine. So you're going to see that uh, it doesn't follow the wall. This is the difference between feces and also gas and foreign bodies. And then as I was telling you before, so this is a linear foreign body, maybe a little bit of uh, shadowing. And then this is plication. The whole wall is involved in the plication. Okay, so cirrhosis so of mucosa, muscular cirrhosis, so everything is involved. Okay, we can also see intussusception. Uh, it's actually pretty cool when you see it. I think it's an image that I really like. Obviously, for the, for the animals, not the best thing, but uh, I think it's a, it's a cool image. You're going to see the typical onion-like image. It's a multi-layered area. The outer bowel is going to be thickened and hypoechoic. Um, and then the inner bowel, it's probably going to be normal. And you might uh, see some fat inside. You have to scan everything, several planes, to avoid confusion with plication or the ileocecalic junction. You can also have an interception of, uh, of the ileocecalic junction, but you have to make sure that when you're doing it, it's actually intersecepted and it's not another, like an artifact of uh, just swiping. So here you have it. Outer bowel is thick in and hypoechoic. Inner bowel is pretty normal. And then the fat inside. OK, and now uh, abnormalities of the wall. So we can have inflammatory disease. They usually, and again, usually are extensive and symmetrical, uh, sorry, the, the wall is extensive and symmetrical thickening, but this is usually not always. And uh, you most of the times have conservative, uh, conservative layering. Again, usually. <laughs> so uh, with gastritis, so inflammation of, um, of, uh, of the stomach wall, you're gonna have either hypoechoic or hyperechoic. They can be focal or diffuse, and you might see some gastric edema. Um, enteritis, uh, so inflammation of the small bowels. Uh, mostly diffuse, affecting several segments, but not always. Um, the thickening of the wall is usually, usually has a conserved layering, but if they're very severe, they can definitely lose the layering. 
you are you're going to have a um, uh, hyperechoic mucosa, especially with chronic arthritis, and um, you might see uh, speckles, like they're called mucosal speckles, which are uh, hyperechoic spots. It can also happen with IBD, and but they can happen also post pandrial so they can happen after eat and they've eaten. So very important also that uh, they're fasted. And then you can also see hyperquick lines that are perpendicular to the lumen. And as we said before, you can see corrugation, not plication. So remember this, when it's plicated, there's a foreign body. When it's corrugated, it can definitely be enteritis and that's it. You can see colitis, which is inflammation of, um, of the colic wall. And uh, you're gonna see a thickened wall with or without visible layering. So here we have colitis. This, I don't know if you remember from, uh, from the normal findings uh, of the colon, you can see that the, the wall was very, very uh, thin in the layering. You could see it, but very subtle. Here you can definitely see the layering and the wall is pretty thickened. Here, another thickened wall. A little bit of corrugation, just a little bit with thickened wall. And here you can see corrugation. So, serosa and uh, Muscular are normal, mucosa and submucosa are involved. Okay, so very important to differentiate between the two of them. Another abnormality of the wall, obviously, neoplasia. So we might see, well, actually, we're going to see a thickened wall with loss of uh, normal layering. Um, we might see pseudo layering in gastric carcinoma is not very often that you see it, so don't sweat it out. Um, you're going to have decreased motility and have re This is important to know, but again, you can't say for sure when you see a bowel that is, uh, that is abnormal, that is uh, thick in only one segment, and it's... Um, and has lost its layering, you can't say for sure. Sometimes you, I mean, you're going to put it on top of, a, of, your, of your list, but you can't say for sure without any, without any either biopsy, contrast ultrasound, or FNA. With large masses, when they're very, very large, especially with cats, you need to confirm GI origin. And this is important because if you, uh, with a lot of uh, with cats, you might think that there are lymph nodes, or you're not sure if there are lymph, uh, like for example, lymphoma, right? We have enlarged lymph nodes, and you, you're not sure if what you're looking, it's a mass in the bowels or uh, the lymph nodes, and that is going to definitely change, especially in the treatment. Are you going to go to surgery? You're not going to take the lymph nodes out. So this is important uh, for you to confirm. How are you going to do this? You're going to try and look or uh, the, the gas and the lumen. So you're gonna see a reverberation artifact. And you're gonna have to try and see a connection to the bowel. So here we have a mass, very thick and wall, hypoechoic. This is the lumen, this is the lumen, and this is the lumen. So in this case, I was able to follow the, the bowel. Most of the times you're able to follow it like a, a normal segment or a thing that it has um, normal layering or almost normal. And here you can see normal bowel, almost normal bowel. And here you can see it was a pretty large um, mass. This was a cat, it was a four centimeter mass. Testicles. So um, you can have them protorquate. So you can have a testicle inside the abdomen or inside the um, the inguinal area, please always check both. A lot of times the vet says, I didn't see it in the inguinal area, so it's in the abdomen. Mm, I'm sorry, I'm not uh, putting, <laughs> I'm not saying that they're lying. Yeah, a lot of times you can't feel it. So always check the inguinal area. You can start from the inguinal area and then move to the abdomen or the opposite. I don't care. Obviously, if you find it in the abdominal, uh, abdominal um, area, then you're, you're going to have to look in the, in the inguinal area, but if you can't find it, always check the inguinal area. So when you're looking uh, for them in the abdomen, you're going to start from the kidney, so caudal to the kidney where the ovaries are, and you're going to start going towards the inguinal ring. So you're going to follow the same path as uh, the testicle does 
one is descending when they're a fetus. So we're going to do that. And I usually, and this is usually, find them very close to the, to the bladder. So either cranial to the bladder, uh, dorsal or ventral to the bladder, or right in the inguinal ring. How are you going to know that you're looking at a testicle? Well, they're hypoechoic, maybe sometimes hyperechoic, but they have a hyperechoic central line, as we said before. So this is what it's going to tell you that you're looking at a testicle and not, for example, a lip. You're going to see also some neoplasia. Um, they're nodules or large masses, but you're not going to be able to differentiate between the type of, uh, of tumor. So you're not going to be able to know if there's uh, the type of tumor that uh, is, um, is not very likely to metastasize or not. So please either take them out or do some other testing. You can have some inflammation, either orchitis or epididymitis. You might see cysts. And you might see also torsion, which uh, you're going to see it uh, decrease blood flow with a color doppler. So here we have a cryptorchid testicle. This was in the inguinal area. You can see this is a muscle. And here, a hypoechoic uh, oval area with a hyperechoic central line. It was pretty small, as you can see here. I don't know, but I can tell you it was probably like one, one and a half centimeters. And then uh, this is a little nodule, not so little <laughs> nodule. This was a case that um, when I came, they said it's probably orchitis because it, it, it was an enlarged testicle. It was very painful. But once I looked inside, this is the normal testicle. Or, I mean, it's a little bit altered, but it wasn't very, very big. It's almost two centimeters. The problem was epididymitis. So this was the epididymis. It was very enlarged and hypoechoic. Obviously, we castrated and everything was good. And then finally, pancreas. So uh, the big, the big P, right? Uh, the ones that we're always, when we're starting, we're always trying to look for. So we can have acute pancreatitis, and um, that is going to be you're going to see a hypoechoic pancreas. It's going to be enlarged. And you're going to have hyperechoic surrounding fat. This is what is going to tell you that you have pancreatitis. In dogs usually involves the right limb, and cats usually involves the left limb and the body. In order to know if it's a necrotizing pancreatitis, you have to know that there's necrosis, and for that, you have to do contrast or ultrasound. You might see other anechoic areas, you can't say for sure that it's necrotic, so you would have to do uh, contrast ultrasound. And now uh, you're, you're gonna see irregular margins. You can also see chronic pancreatitis, and it's going to be a disomogeneous uh, parenchyma with hyperechoic areas. You can also see edema, either with pancreatitis or also with hypoalbuminemia, and uh, you're going to see hypoechoic stripes. You can see cysts, which can be also from pancreatitis, <laughs> it can also be congenital, and then uh, you might see abscesses. So this was an acute pancreatitis, hyperechoic fats hyperechoic fats with a hypoechoic hypoechoic parenchyma. In this case, it was a, it was a dog. So you're not going to see the, the duct is usually very dilated in, in cats. Okay, then I'm going to, to end this, uh, this presentation, I'm going to put a, a few clinical cases. So Pedro is a 10-year-old labra, Labrador retriever. He's diabetic, diagnosed a few years ago. He's also epileptic uh, with an ongoing therapy with phenobarbital. But lately, his diabetes is, hasn't been under control. So he, uh, his glucose has been, uh, has been very high, even after changing the uh, dose of insulin. So we do an ultrasound, and uh, okay, we find a little bladder stone. Not very important or not very <laughs> concerning. Here, uh, I, I want you to see the, um, uh, the adrenal glands because a lot of dogs that have uh, di uh, diabetes can have also Cushing's disease and it gets worsened with that. So uh, the, in this case, the adrenal glands were pretty normal. The liver was mm, not too bad. It was a little bit enlarged, not too, yeah, not too bad. But, uh, obviously, there was food in, uh, inside his stomach, 
And when I try to look for the pleuric area, this popped out. This here, this here, this here. So this is a mass of the pleuric area, so a mass in the gastric wall. Uh, it was a four centimeter wall, uh, sorry, four centimeter mass. So what uh, this was causing, it was causing the, the stomach not to empty properly. So he always had food inside his stomach. So his glucose was always high because he always had food. It was as he always, uh, he was always eating. So this was uh, the main thing. I have to say in this case, we were lucky and the, the veterinarian was very um, proactive because usually the usual plan would have been, let's do a glucose curve. And uh, probably they, they, have, they would have seen the glucose high due to the decrease of stomach emptying. Maybe they'd have, they would have done a change the insulin, but uh, maybe, maybe not, they would have seen uh, an ultrasound. Without an ultrasound, we would probably never, um, never find the, count, the cause. So um, just as a note, no further, I recommended further testing, they didn't do it. Uh, but the patient is still alive and uh, it's a uh, much better control after changing his insulin. So this is important. If they had done uh, the change of the insulin, then probably the dog would, uh, would have been much better and they wouldn't have done anything else and we wouldn't have um, uh, an actual diagnosis. And then the clinical case number two, Ruby. Ruby is a two-year-old mixed breed. She was paid uh, at the age of one, maybe a little bit earlier. Um, and, but in the past few weeks, she's been having vaginal discharge. It wasn't hemorrhagic, so uh, she wasn't in heat. Uh, and as you can see, there were no signs of heat. Uh, she was just having some discharge. So we do the ultrasound. This is what we find. This is a bladder. This is the urine stump. So here, the uterus was taken out, but this is what it was left. It was a two centimeter mass. I'm going to say mass because we don't know what it is. It was vascularized. And in the ovarian regions, we see this. So we see this area, one centimeter, one centimeter, this was left, this was the right. It was, yeah, one centimeter. Some hyperechoic areas inside, as you can see, those are probably the sutures. There was a little bit of blood supply. So what are the, diagnosis, uh, the differential diagnosis? It can be an ovarian remnant syndrome, but there were no signs of heat, but still can be. They can be granulomas. They can be, uh, it can be a neoplasia, but with the age, I'm a little bit less concerned about that, but can definitely be. It could also be a gauze or another foreign body, but it has blood supply, so it is uh, less likely. But you have to put in the, in the uh, report, you, can all, you always have to put all the differential diagnosis. So um, laparoscopy was, uh, was done. And um, actually, not laparoscopy. I'm sorry for that. It was laparotomy. Uh, it, was, uh, it was done, and uh, they didn't see any ovarian tissue, but apparent uh, granulomas. And uh, further testing and further surgery is going to uh, will have to be done because that granuloma of the uterine had uh, it was uh, it was dear to a lot of tissue, so it's not going to be uh, it's not going to be an easy one. So, well, um, before we start, I wanted you to um, to know what we did in this video. So, we wanted to do a practice for you as you were asking for you to know how to place the probe in the animal and also itself. Uh, it was hard for us to, um, to do a good video without moving a lot because uh, we checked it and we saw that when we were moving a lot, uh, the video paused and we lost, uh, we lost some, um, some quality of the image. So just so you know, we're not filmmakers, so we did, we did our best for you to try and see the, the probe and, and the animal and at the same time to try and see the image that we're looking at the screen. Okay, so I hope, I hope you like it. I'm not, you're not going to see, you're not going to hear uh, the audio from the video. And what, we, what I'm going to do is I'm going to explain how, uh, what I'm going to do. Okay, so here we go. Okay, so first of all, when we start, we have to place the marker. I usually place it cranially. It doesn't matter if you want to do it caudally. The important thing is that uh, you place the marker in the screen the same, uh, at the same orientation. So uh, I start from the bladder, uh, marker cranially, I start from the bladder. Now we're gonna move 
for you to see the, the image. There we are. And that is a bladder. I move, he's my dog, he's Hugo, and uh, he's a neuter male. So I went hollow to look for the prostate and you can see it right there. And, um, and the prostate, as you can see, is uh, homogeneous, hypoechoic and small. Then I moved dorsally to look for the aortic bifurcation and uh, to see, to look for the medial iliac lymph nodes. And you're gonna, I'm gonna show it to you now. There they are. They're a little bit small, obviously, because um, the image is not uh, very close. But you can see that the aortic bifurcation right uh, dorsal to that, you're gonna find the lymph nodes. Then I moved cranially, exactly, <laughs> still with a marker uh, cranial. And right before the subcoastal area, you're going to see the, um, the kidney. Uh, in my dog, he has uh, the kidneys a little bit deep, so I, I had to go deeper to see the whole kidney because you, you have to make sure that you see the whole organ. And then I went a little medial, and that is where the uh, adrenal gland is. So you can see it right there. I'm measuring it. It was normal. Obviously, I made sure that he didn't have uh, a lot of problems. So um, then I'm moving also cranially, always with a marker cranial. I'm moving cranially to see the spleen. And then what I'm going to do from here, and you're going to see it now, is that I'm going to start swiping the, screen, the spleen all over. So I'm subcoastal, and I'm going to do all the planes that I can. So swiping everything different planes, because we, we want to make sure we see everything from the spleen. So you can see in the image that I'm swiping everything right now. Then uh, what I'm doing is, uh, um, you can see the spleen also uh, going right next to the liver. I decreased a little bit the quality of the image. I took uh, away the harmonics, because when we have a, a liver that, um, in a, in a large breed dog, you might lose a little bit of the quality of image, so you can um, decrease it. And as with the spleen, you can swipe everything in all different planes. So there I am moving everything just to make sure that we see all the lobes, that we don't miss anything. That is the, I was pointing the spleen, the liver, that is the gallbladder, a little bit sludge, he was fasted. And then I move a little caudally to see the, um, the stomach, a lot of, um, a lot of gas, because my, uh, my dog, he's a golden retriever and he eats everything that he finds. So he has a, a little bit of gastritis and a lot of gas. <laughs> and um, now I, I shape the, the stomach and I'm moving caudally to look, to see all the intestines. You're gonna see they're filled with gas. So um, again, this is my dog, he's like that. But I'm swiping everything just to make sure that I see all of the, all of the bowels that I can find in this side. There we have one. You can see all the gas that, <laughs> that, you have, that he has. And again, you can, you can move the, um, the pro, swiping everything, also rotating and swiping everything you can find, you can follow. Um, you can follow all the, all the bowels. And then what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you where the left lobe of the pancreas should be. And um, you can see the spleen is going to be dorsally, then the stomach, then the liver. And right there is going to be the left lobe of the pancreas. Again, we weren't able to see it there, but uh, that is uh, where it should be. And then we turn them over. And uh, again, marker cranially, marker cranially in the, um, in the screen. If you put it caudally, just make sure that you put it, you uh, switch it uh, in screen. And I'm doing a swiping of all the intestines. Same thing here, uh, intestines filled with gas. <laughs> so it wasn't as easy as I, I expected. There I'm um, pointing out the ilocecocolic junction, which is gonna be a little cranially. And you can see, and the, the probe is already a little bit subcoastal because sometimes with deep chested dogs, you can find it a little bit subcoastal. That is a duodenum. And again, swiping everything, duodenum. You can see the rectilinear course. So much gas. <laughs> then I'm going to show you the lymph nodes. So those are the jejunal lymph nodes. 
you can see the duodenum also there. Then I'm going to be moving a little dorsally. Hold on. There, I'm going to be moving dorsal, dorsally and a little subcostal. Look how dorsal I am. Very, very dorsal. And you're going to see the kidney. You can't see it very well from, from that, but there it is. There you can see the kidney. Very, very dorsal. Okay. So don't, sometimes don't panic if you can't find it because you have to go dorsal or a lot of times even um, uh, intercostal. And then to look for the adrenal gland, and as I was telling you, that's this, uh, the kidney. And I'm going to do a little swipe medial, medially, and that is where it pops out. The, um, that is what I did. So it went a little medial, and then it just comes out. The aorta, the vena cava, and right in the middle, you can see the, I did a little zoom for you to, to see. There it is. That is the right adrenal gland. I took another picture. <laughs> there you are. Okay, then I'm going to move cranially. I'm going to try and go a little subcostal, but you can see that my dog is already breathing a little bit hard because probably it's not very comfortable. And you can try and see the liver. You can see the, di uh, the diaphragm, and you can see the liver. I uh, decrease the harmonics. And you can also increase the, the maps of gray because that is going to uh, help you to see, to have a, a better image in a, in a large breed dog. And again, I was, I was swiping everything, as you can see, as I did with, uh, with the right uh, area. Sorry, with the left side. <laughs> I'm swiping everything. I'm doing it a little bit faster than I, I would normally do, obviously, because we're just showing. But I would normally take a lot of uh, pictures and everything, so. And then what I'm trying to do here is I'm gonna show you the stomach, and I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna try and show you where the uh, pyloric area should be. He has a lot of gas, so um, we're not gonna be able to actually see it, but I'm gonna tell you where um, the area is. This is gonna happen with a lot of times. You're not gonna see the pleuris because uh, there's a lot of either food or gas. So there's the stomach, you can see subcostal, and I'm moving dorsally, so it's dorsocranial, you can see dorsally, and right there when I'm pointing, that is where the pyloris is, and I'm gonna show you in the screen where it should be, because there it is, that is where it should be. I can see a little bit of the duodenum, I can see the, uh, a little bit of the stomach, but I can't see the actual uh, pyloris, but you can see it right there. And then last but not least, I'm going to show you the pancreas. So I look for the duodenum and right dorsal to the duodenum. There it is, the pancreas. I can move a little bit on a caudal, but right there. Okay, 